Um, I'm Anissa Shell. I'm the director of zoning and planning for District 1. Um, I wanted to introduce myself and um, welcome everybody to our town hall for the Sunken Gardens Theater bond proposal. Um, I have a couple of ground rules for everybody. Um, the number one rule is to please keep your microphone muted when you are not speaking. Um, we also ask that you please keep your questions on topic and concise to please be respectful of everyone on the call and to allow others time to speak. We have over 100 people signed in so far, and I see more joining. Um, so if everyone could just please stay focused. That will help us get to everybody who has questions and concerns. Um, in addition, I want to make sure everyone is aware we are recording this meeting um, and we will be sharing the recording. So please be aware of that. Um, I want Carson Maldonado to please introduce herself. She's going to help me with um, capturing questions in the chat. Um, and then I will have everyone else introduce themselves as we go. Carson? Hi, everybody. I'm Carson Maldonado. I am the director of communications for District 1. I'll be monitoring the chat, looking for questions, and trying to help Anissa out through this process. So we look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give each of uh, our council members that are here a, a minute or two to say a few words. Um, so let's start with District 1 Councilman Mario Blanco. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for participating. It's exciting to see so many people logging on right now. And um, the purpose of this town hall is to give you all an opportunity to voice any of your concerns. We've we heard, uh, our office heard a lot of concerns about this proposed Sunken Gardens Theater project, and uh, we wanted to give you all an opportunity to share those concerns and the the the, the individuals who are. We wanted to give an opportunity to the individuals who are proposing this project to be able to address those concerns and see if they could alleviate them and try and find out what what is the appropriate project here um, that you know can best serve our community. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you all are here today. Um, you know we'll talk more about the public input process soon, but I'll, I'll hand it over to District Two Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez. So thank you. Hello. Scotty, I am so impressed by the turnout. Uh, I want to start saying thank you so much to the district one office for putting this all together and getting the word. I also want to say thank you to all of the concerns and community members um, throughout the city who, um, you know, have, I, I was at the bond meetings and I, I saw y'all come out full force and um, I've gotten your emails and the calls and the messages on all the social medias. So, um, just want to. I just want you to know that I've heard you, and I appreciate you, um, your participation in not democracy. Uh, this decision making process as a whole. Um, I think so often we forget the word or that decisions are already made, and I want this proof that you know we don't put calls like this and uh, you know have people do presentations because decisions are made. Um, I think this is a real opportunity to. Hear the community also, uh, you know, get answers and questions and demands um, of the developer and of the applicant. And these are public dollars. This is, uh, I believe, five million dollars in public dollars that we're talking about. And so I want it to be something when we're going we're voting and we're saying I'm excited about all the projects list, or I'm excited about most, or I believe that, you know projects on this list I'm voting on are going to um, better my community. And so what I want us to get to today is an understanding of what would it take for this development for Sunken Gardens Theater um, to meet that qualification. What would, what would it take for people to say, I'm supporting And so think of it not just as, I don't think anyone here wants things to stay exactly we don't expect no development, no renovations to ever happen, um, but we also don't expect to be given renderings and just assume that those are the end that we have to. I think we can accept change. So, um, please, please do this in, with uh, with good in good faith. Thank you all again for having me. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I also want to introduce um, Razi uh, Husini from the Public Works Department. Um, Razi is going to tell us a little bit about the bond process and what public input looks like um, for bond projects, uh, not just this project, but how um, that works overall. Razi. Yeah, thank you, Anissa, and good evening, everyone. I am Razi Hosseini, Director of City Engineer. I have been involved on a development and implementation of many bonds for the last three decades. Over three decades, I have been with San Antonio. I will be providing you what we have done so far and what we are going to do really from here on until May 7th when bond public passes, and then we will have the consulting and have community meeting and get really input from you and other community on all of the project, not just Sunken Garden, I think, Drainage Project, Broadway Project, Park Project, and so on. Back to you, Anissa. Thank you. Um, just so everyone knows, I'm trying to find the setting to mute it when people join the meeting. I know that's causing some um, audio problems for people. Um, please bear with us as we look for that setting. And um, next, I would like to ask uh, the folks from the Brackenridge Conservancy to present their um, project proposal. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions, and so um, I ask you guys to please remain patient through this presentation uh, so that um, perhaps some of your questions will be answered by it. And then if not, we will uh, get to those after the presentation. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Suzanne Scott. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Suzanne Scott, and uh, I am a member of the uh, board of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. We have several board members that are joining us today that will be available to answer questions uh, after our presentation. Thank you so much to Councilman Bravo and McKee Rodriguez for hosting this town hall tonight. We really appreciate the opportunity to share the concept plans for the restoration enhancement of the Sunken Garden Theater as part of a comprehensive effort really to improve the natural, historical and cultural resources of Brackenridge Park. But before sharing the presentation on the concepts for the Sunken Garden Theater, just wanted to take a couple of minutes to give a little bit of background on how we got here today. The Brackenridge Park Conservancy was created in 2009 through a cooperative, uh, cooperative management agreement with the City of San Antonio to raise funds to benefit the park, develop programming, and support the evolution of plans and projects with our partners, and generally to build community support for the well-being of the park. Over the years, the Conservancy has um, hosted programs and has been working with the City of San Antonio to complete capital improvement projects within the park. The Conservancy cooperated with the City in the development of the City's Master Plan for Brackenridge Park in 2017. And that Master Plan involved a lot of stakeholders and came up with specific goals for the park and two of those specifically that are really related to the efforts that we're moving forward as part of the bond are improving water quality and restoring the uh, natural features of the park and then also restoring and preserving cultural and historical features. We took that master plan and then worked with the city of San Antonio to develop a cultural landscape report that kind of dug deeper into all the natural and cultural resources of the park and identify kind of the next steps we would need to go through to develop the natural and cultural aspects of the park. And in both the master plan and the cultural landscape report, the Sunken Garden Theater was identified as a very important opportunity to enhance the use and enjoyment of the park's resources and to restore a very important cultural feature of the park. In addition, Y'all may already be aware that this, the Brackenridge Park Conservancy worked with the San Antonio River Authority and uh, Bear County to move forward with the Bear County River and Creek program, which is uh, was approved by Bear County uh, as part of their budget process that's allocating more than $27 million to projects to improve water quality, restore the river's ecosystem, and add connection from the park to the blue hole that is known as the Spirit 
Uh, all those projects have been working uh, collaboratively with the city of San Antonio and the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. Most recently, through the city's bond process, there are two funding proposals uh, supporting park improvements, including $2.5 million for the general park improvements and $5 million for the renovation of the Sunken Garden Theater, which is what we're here tonight to talk about. As part of that project in 2019, after the completion of the cultural landscape report, the, the city uh, San Antonio Parks and Recreation Department entered into an agreement with the Brackenridge Park Conservancy to complete a feasibility study on the Sunken Garden Theater. This feasibility study was really a scope that was comprehensive to look at multiple components, including design, operation, management, cost estimates, all these components that you're gonna be seeing uh, just in a couple of minutes in this uh, report today. That was submitted to the city of San Antonio in August of 2020. Uh, and there were several presentations uh, made of those results. Uh, we did make a preliminary presentation to the River Road Neighborhood Association, the, Con the Conservation Society, the San Antonio Parks Foundation and the Zuli Foundation. And in, in preparation for the bond process, the Bar Brackenridge Park Conservancy did present the project publicly in, in the late summer of 21 for consideration for bond funding. But I wanna to stress to you that the project design and operational plans and costs that you will see are conceptual and will benefit greatly from much more public engagement as these plans move forward. It is our hope that the community will embrace the value of restoring and improving this historic venue at the Sunken Garden Theater. Just as with all the projects, as Rosie just mentioned, all the projects in the bond, once the funding is approved by the voters, the real work to develop that project begins. We are eager to work with the community and to collaborate with various stakeholders to advance these efforts to develop a place for enjoyment and celebration for all San Antonians and have another quality destination within Brackenridge Park. I think together we can achieve a vision for the Sunken Garden Theater that, that stakeholders can embrace and we can develop together. When the Brackenridge Park Conservancy was asked to conduct the feasibility study, we did contract with an expert in the design and operation of entertainment venues. Uh, and that, uh, but we also wanted someone that had an appreciation for the uniqueness of the Sunken Garden Theater and its history and significance in the San Antonio cultural heritage. We engaged Kurt Feldman, who you will see on the presentation in just a couple of minutes. He has dedicated his life to work uh, on live entertainment venues. For over 40 years, he's built his career in, uh, and working his way up through every job in the business. He was just an independent consultant that's helped us on this project. He is not the developer or the operator. Those decisions have not been made. He has worked on other um, venues here in San Antonio, including the Majestic and the Charlene McCombs Empire Theater. So he does have experience from top to bottom on understanding uh, how uh, to develop these live, live venue uh, uh, facilities. So we have a video that we would like to be sharing with you as part of the presentation this evening. I just wanted to start with giving you a little bit of background of how we got here today, and we look forward to your uh, feedback and engaging in more public uh, input as we move forward with this project. So I believe we have a video to show. There's no sound on the video right now. We had it working earlier. While they're addressing the sound, I want to go ahead and let people know who've been asking about the public input process to date. 
And so I wanted to let everyone know that we selected each council district selected three bond committee members for the park community bond committee meetings. And they had four meetings, one on November 9th, the 16th, December 7th and December 14th. And two of those meetings were dedicated to public input. Um, in addition to that, um, our, dis our city council district one office hosted a, a town hall or round table with our bond committee appointees so that they could hear directly from you all about any ideas or concerns that you had for projects uh, so that they could carry your voice forward into the committee meetings. Um, so we, our office provided the Sunken Garden Theater bond proposal presentation to the River Road Neighborhood Association on November 15th. And we also offered to arrange a presentation for the association on the proposal. Uh, any any letters that we received from you all um, during the bond committee process for with the with the um, citizen committee members, we forwarded any of those emails from you to the committee members. And what was originally proposed, I guess, asked for by the develop the, the developers who were proposing this project was twenty five million dollars. On October thirteenth, city staff made a recommendation of $20 million for this $1.2 billion bond. Uh, then after some input, a revised staff recommendation was set at $10 million. And then when it went to the citizens bond committee process, the citizens bond committee members reduced that to $5 million, which is where the current uh, suggestion is at this point. So I just wanted to share that with you all while we're trying to figure out the sound. Thank you. Doris, um, do you want to give it another try? I know we did do a test run earlier. I apologize for the inconvenience, but they did do a test run and it worked. No problem. Let's, let's just try it again. And if not, maybe somebody from your team could narrate. Yeah, we could do that if necessary. I know some people are eager to get to the Q&A portion. I completely understand. I apologize. Uh, Doris, can you bring up the, the presentation, please? Yes, give me a moment, please. I can narrate. This is Kirk. Installing. Um, Doris, do you have the link to share? And then select the screen. Sorry, disappeared off my computer. I'm looking for it. I apologize. Kirk, do you have the link? Can you just let me pull try? It up? Let me try. I'm going to try to share. Just share, please. We just got to get going here. I want to be respectful of the time of these people that have joined us this evening. Is that showing? It's showing, yes. Just no sound. Part of the oh, there it is. Fabric of 
San Antonio. It has been here since 1930 and uh, almost 92 years now. And there have been generations of San Antonio that have uh, grown up coming to uh, listen to concerts uh, at the Sutton Garden Theater. And my own father uh, went to the very first performance of the San Antonio Symphony on June 12, 1939, when he was 14 years old. Uh, that was held here. And uh, he, he came here to see that. And uh, it is a, a dream of mine to be able to come to the first uh, concert at a newly renovated Sutton Garden Theater. So this is such a, a uh, historical theater and a central part of the renovation is going to be to preserve uh, those historical features like these columns behind me and integrate them into a new state of the art performing arts venue. We still feel like like uh, this park is the gathering place for the entire community that it is it, that it is fitting that a, a venue uh, of, of this quality uh, be in Brackenridge Park and, and part of the fabric of the most significant cultural part of the United States. And in order to preserve this historic venue for future generations, investments have to be made. And the money that is spent to renovate this theater is going to pay dividends for more generations to come. Hello, my name is Kirk Feldman, President and CEO of KBF and Associates. The following video is going to give you some information related to the redevelopment plans for the Sunken Garden Theater in San Antonio. Within the mission of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy is the redevelopment of the Sunken Garden Theater. The venue will become a world-class outdoor performance theater, with a historically sensitive design, first-class amenities for artists and patrons, and welcoming to the very best performing talents in the world. The theater will attract visitors and San Antonians alike, nourishing souls with the vibrancy and fun of great music in a safe and beautiful environment. The venue is centrally located in the heart of our city, accessible to all. The theater is located in Brackenridge Park, bordered by Alamo Stadium to the northwest, the Japanese Tea Garden to the northeast, and the park itself to the southeast and southwest. The venue occupies approximately three acres in the 349-acre park. The current conditions are substandard, leaving the venue unusable to most professional touring attractions. Combined, in 2018 and 2019, 180 touring productions bypassed San Antonio for the lack of a proper facility of this size. The theater has suffered from nominal local usage, substandard facilities, inadequate staging and power, outdated dressing room facilities, temporary restroom and concessions facilities, and non-compliance with ADA codes. In support of the revitalization efforts, the Conservancy commissioned a number of supporting studies affirming the need for a mid-sized venue, self-sustaining operations, ample parking, traffic plans which can protect nearby neighborhood interests, the cost of construction, and substantial economic impact. The proposed revitalization seeks to restore and renovate the Sunken Garden Theater into a state-of-the-art outdoor theater. The venue will feature 7,000 seats, 5,900 of which are fixed seats and 1,100 lawn seats, an enclosed stage house, a mass timber roof covering most of the seating, 48 to 60 annual concerts, 185 to 230,000 annual attendance, self-sustaining venue operation, and diversified programming for all San Antonians. In examining the current inventory of venues in San Antonio, it is notable that our city has no mid-sized venue. Shown here is the gap that exists between the four largest and four smallest venues. It is this positioning that makes the redevelopment of this venue so compelling. Because of its central location, which is easily accessible from all corners of our city, the Sunken Garden Theater is well situated to host a wide variety of attractions. Whether it's comedy, Latino, R&B, hip hop, country, pop, rock, or world music, 
the menu will offer something for everyone. The revitalization will provide for a historically sensitive design, including a beautiful expanded menu entrance, two landscaped concessions plazas, ample permanent restrooms, permanent concessions facilities, specialty food and beverage kiosks, fixed seating undercover, elevator and ramp access to the lawn, a closed stage house, enlarged and improved dressing room, and a loading dock with bus parking. An expanded entrance to the theater will serve to make ingress and egress safe and efficient. The entrance will feature a wide entry plaza, professional box office, patron health screening, touch free ticketing, and LED marquee displays. The venue will further feature a mass timber roof above the seats and a closed stage house, restoration of the Grecian colonnade and historic structures, a restored waterfall feature behind the stage, a restored outbuilding house left, tremendous sight lines, LED lighting fixtures throughout, closed circuit image magnification video screens, and an ADA compliant layout. Additionally, the design includes permanent concession stands in plazas on each side of the stage, specialty food kiosks, permanent restroom facilities, health and security facilities, an elevated lawn seating area, and lawn concessions facilities. The projected cost of construction includes $56.1 million in construction costs, $5.9 million in soft costs, or a grand total of $62 million. The budget includes $7.6 million in contingencies and escalation. The economic impact of this project is profound. The redevelopment of the Sunken Garden Theater is projected to generate nearly 1,000 full-time equivalent construction jobs generating an economic impact of $111 million and 171 full-time equivalent jobs annually from operations with a annual impact of $18.2 million. Combined, the economic impact for the first 10 years would be $239 million. This includes retained local attendees no longer traveling to Houston, Austin, or Dallas to see shows. Sound attenuation is an important area of focus for this project. Currently, the Sunken Garden Theater has no physical improvements that serve to moderate sound emission. Accordingly, the Conservancy instructed the architect to provide a conceptual design that includes improvements known in the industry to have beneficial attributes to minimizing sound emissions. The major design improvements include an enclosed concrete stage house, mitigating 360 degree sound emission currently occurring an absorptive roof over the audience seating area serving to compress and contain sound, a sound attenuation barrier located along Alpine Drive to further mitigate sound emissions, absorption panels located on the rear wall of the venue designed to minimize slapback echo, and a permanent sound mixing position to manage sound output. Successful and efficient traffic and parking management is important to both venue operations and nearby local neighborhoods. A comprehensive traffic management plan consistently enforced for all theater events will be implemented in coordination with the San Antonio Police Department, the Park Police, and the San Antonio Zoo. Community input in this process is important. The plan will seek to protect the River Road Neighborhood Association via managed access and advance notification. New traffic patterns will create the primary park entry point at Stadium Drive away from the St. Mary's and Hildebrand Streets intersections. Forced routes for ingress and egress will be utilized. A citywide show-by-show -show communication campaign will direct attendees. Controlled and staggered parking lot loading and unloading will speed the process. In conjunction with traffic management is the efficient loading of parking spaces. Available parking spaces within one third of a mile total 2,976. Additional nearby spaces including spaces served by shuttle, raise this total to 5,671. This is an abundant number of available spaces. On average, projected theater attendance will be approximately 3,875 patrons. 10% of these patrons will utilize ride sharing services such as Uber and Lyft. Attendance will vary show by show and year by year. Parking demand on average will be for 1,200 parking spaces. Peak demand for parking at full capacity will be 2,100 spaces. The current inventory of parking spaces 
including the new 600 car garage located on Tuleta and Stadium Drive, affirms the ability to safely and efficiently park all theater patrons. The redevelopment of Sunken Garden Theater will be an asset to the entire community, an economic generator, and the source of fun-filled memories for generations to come. You know, this is the People's Park. It is the, it is the most popular park in the city of San Antonio. Um, and this is an amenity that sits inside of the park, and we want to bring back the amenities that historically were here. Um, the, the Conservancy has, is working hard to do Sunken Garden Theater. We're working hard on all the original rock walls, some of the buildings that are collapsing. We're trying to make uh, provide more, more public space, more places for people to be able to recreate. So this is just part of the knitting back together of what was already here. We're not looking in, in, in Brackenridge Park really at this particular point in time to do anything more than restore it. It's a fantastic park, but it sees over 1.5 million visitors a year. And frankly, it's overlooked. The Conservancy wants this park to be a very, very special place for all San Antonians. Um, we want to renovate all of the wonderful things we can. This is one of our largest facilities and one of our largest single projects that are available. So we need the support of the San Antonians to get behind this, to get behind the arts, to get behind the architecture of the facility itself, to get behind that history. We have the support of the city. We're getting the support of the county. That support of business interests and the conservancy and ch and charitable interests as well. We need all of San Antonio to coalesce around this wonderful theater, this park that everybody uses on a regular basis. This is the people's park, and we need the community to buy into the people's park, to buy into its renovation, to buy into its rehabilitation, and this is one very very important element of that. Thank you. Um, before we get started on um, taking questions and comments, I just want to remind everyone of our ground rules. Ask that if you are using the chat for questions, um, that will definitely be helpful. If you have comments um, that can add to the discussion, we want to hear that as well or see that in the chat as well. Um, but please keep it respectful so that we can try to get to as many people as possible. Um, I was hoping Rosie could take a minute and explain to everybody uh, what the input process looks like should the funding for this bond proposal be approved by the voters. Rosie, can you speak to that, please? Can you hear me? <clears throat> Yes, Apparently we are anticipating in February 10th, which is a 2, 3 weeks from now. Council to approve on these list of the project is a. Community bond committee present to council in January 12. After his approval, of course, the bond will pass in. A first Saturday, hopefully, um, first Saturday in May. We will do. Funding agreement with all of these parties, UTSC, Sunken Garden, and others, they are receiving funding from us. It will be very detailed contract. Council will be reviewing and approving what will be the schedule of the project, what's the cost of the project, what's the benefit of this project for the community. And Council, of course, has to prove that one before really this project goes forward. That's on Sunken Garden, but of course we have a many projects other than really funding agreement on those projects. Public Works Department working with other department. We advertise project hire consulting, and after we hire a consultant, we negotiate take to council to prove its staff recommendation. After after councils approve, on average project we have three meeting with communities, two meeting during design development on one meeting during construction. One of the reason on most of this project, we have the scope very general. Of course, during the bond process, there was concern why the scope is not detailed. That was done in intentionally because not too many people attend those community meetings. When we go to community, we really hear from them 
what they like to really see on this project, especially on park project and facility. And we get very detailed input from them on very early stage of project development. Then we take back to them like 40% design, 75% to make sure we are addressing their concern. And after design is done, we advertise for construction and we come after we have the contractor, we come to neighborhood, we tell those meetings, here we come, introduce the contractor for community, introduce city representative for the community. And of course we start the project for construction and we usually provide update for community on that particular project, monthly update where we are, if we are especially planning to close the lane or do some other thing is going to affect the public travel at the time. I am I will be available until the end of this meeting to answer any question anybody may have. Thank you. Councilman Rod McKee Rodriguez, you have your I see that you've used the raise hand feature. Um, I want to point that out to everybody. That might be the easiest way for us to take questions. Um, so if you uh, see the setting, um, it says reactions on my screen. You can use that to raise your hand. Um, and if you have questions, um, we would like to wait, have you wait until you're called on with your hand raised. Um, and before we get to that, Councilman, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Anissa, and thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I do want to address a question that was in the chat, and I want to make sure that uh, we get an answer to that verbally. Um, will all the comments be able to be archived? Um, do we have anybody from IT here that knows how that works? Um, well, we're recording the meeting, and I believe the comments will be recorded as well, and I think there's also the ability for us to download it. Um, it is our intention to capture all of that. Okay. Um, if and when you're able to capture all of that, all those questions and whatnot, uh, I would love um, if you would, if you want to work with my staff to um, get answers to the questions, and we can send uh, responses. I want to make sure that because I know there was a lot of comments and a lot of feedback, and so if uh, I don't want to put that all on you, so just know that uh, my office is we want to we want to help that. Um, one of the concerns that I saw repeated multiple times, there's going to be, um, there's differing opinions on the design. There's, I just read a comment that someone said it's an unpopular opinion, but they love the renderings. I've seen other people who say it's absolutely dreadful and they want nothing, no parts in that. Um, I think we're going to, we're going to struggle if we focus entirely on design. I think things like capacity are super, um, those are things that, you know, we can have productive conversations about traffic, what to do when there are, especially when this is such a large, um, large scale um, venue, when events are happening here and they're also happening at the zoo or at the park or at anywhere else. Um, I see a lot of people want to know who's benefiting, who's who's getting money under the table, and uh, I I do want it to be. I want to reiterate a comment in there that all the members of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy um, have no financial interest in the project. Um, I do think that. Um, it's a good idea to go over the, fin the finances as they stand right now. Where is the where are you currently going to be getting money from in addition to this $5 million ask and in addition to TERS, just so people have an understanding of what it is that we're talking about now. In a couple weeks, what, when council's voting, it's not on the project itself. It's not on the $63 million budget. It's on a portion of funding. I also would love to hear an outline of what the potent, what the future public engagement will look like if and when this is approved um, and how we can continue to address the concerns of the community. Um, I'm not sure if Frank had, is Frank going to be the one answering questions? Or Sarah? Uh, or not Sarah? Jalen, I'll be glad to take the question about financial. If you can me, okay? Uh, the proposed budget, uh, which includes <coughs> a uh, allocation for increased expenses and other unexpected, is $63 million. Uh, $5 million is in the bond proposal recommended by the bond committees and the city and initial staff recommendation. Uh, there, were, there is a proposal to uh, allocate TERS funding to many of the city-owned facilities along Broadway, from the Witte to the Zoo, to Brookings Park, to Sun Garden Theaters, uh, and, and uh, the um, Botanical Gardens. Uh, that's a that's a separate decision being made by the council at a later date. 
Um, in addition to that, we're hoping that the Bear County is considering a venue tax uh, later in the year, and we're hoping that we can have funds allocated by Bear County uh, in the amount of $25 million, uh, which leads a shortfall of $13 million. Uh, the Breckenridge Park Conservancy has already raised over $5 million for other projects associated with the park, and they, uh, again, have undertaken the task that they will try to raise that money, the $13 million, and will also ask for things like consideration for naming rights, uh, if someone wants to name the facility, uh, and also that we expect uh, any the potential operator, whoever that may be, will bring some dollars to the table uh, to help with the cost of construction. Thank you. And the purpose of that question was so that um, all of you who are watching and participating, I want you to know this, um, what we're talking about right now is for the vote, the $5 million that city council is allocated currently for the bond, but there are still other means in which um, uh, opportunities to hold the developers accountable, including TERS, which is um, a city council, ter it's city TERS, um, and then the county, there's also going to be other private funding and donations from that way. Um, but this is a small portion of the overall budget. And so even if council were to say no on this 5 million, I don't want you to think that that means that this project's not going to happen or that there's not still engagement that needs to take place. Please continue to be a part of the process. Um, but there are some wonderful comments in here and I, I don't know if it's been outlined yet how that's going to be handled. So I'll, I'll send it back to you, Anissa. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience. I did confirm that all of the chat is being recorded, not private messages, but anything that is in the general to everyone chat gets um, logged with the recording. So anything that we missed tonight or that we don't have time for, we will come back to to get answers. Um, I'm going to start calling on some people that have their hands raised. Um, please uh, unmute yourself when I call you. Mary, I see that you have your hand up. Thank you very much for allowing me to make this comment. I'll be as efficient as possible. My name is Mary Sandoval. I do live in the River Road area. And just as an initial statement, this is a proposal that transcends River Road it affects the entire city. Ms. Scott referred to uh, reaching out to River Road. For those of you who don't know, we were approached in September of last year. A size of this proposal, this dimension, which has been in the hands of the city and the Conservancy for at least two years or more, and was presented privately to politicians and other people before the public outreach uh, does not constitute a meaningful opportunity to be heard. This is a good start, but I really hope that uh, the two councilmen who sponsored this meeting realize now that much more opportunities need to be heard. My main point is this, and I address it to Mr. Feldman and Mr. Burning and the Conservancy as a whole. The need is probably the most uh, concerning argument that the Conservancy puts forth. The need for a mid-size venue is really called into question. We know there's alternate venues already in existence that are not located in a delicate ecosystem, 1,500 feet from 3,000 animals and an urban core. The real life amphitheater is just one of those. And we are not, we should not be required to accept that revenue is just constantly going to other cities. Those of us who know how concert performers choose their venues know that there's a myriad of reasons for choosing a venue. If a country and Western singer, for example, thinks he can book three serial concerts in Dallas because there's more people buying his albums there, it will be done there regardless of the venue. There's tax incentives, there's sound systems to consider, there's negotiated discounts between the performers and the hosts uh, and the sponsors with hotels. It's not just size, and we shouldn't be required to accept that, that all these, the data, the little data that has been provided by the Conservancy, that we lost all that revenue. I'm sorry, that, that just, that dog won't hunt. Um, there's- Ms. I'll be glad. I think we can answer your question about 
the how venues were selected. Kirk uh, Feldman has operated the Majestic and Empire, built those facilities. He was involved in the operation 15 years, and I think he can ask ask answer your question about how dates and why this 7,000 seat uh, number was picked. If Kirk, if you want to try that, Mr. Bernie, uh, sure. really respectfully, can I just finish my comment and then they can? Sure, I'm sorry. I thought you were through. I apologize. No, sorry. Um, the other concern is if you're and these are your words, self-sustaining target of 60 concerts is not met. Who suffers the loss? Will the promoters seeking will seek the city of San Antonio to indemnify the loss? And when you talk about uh, and the example that's been published in the papers by people who are promoting this proposal that they've done uh, the Snoop Dogg concert with absolutely no reaction from or danger health of the animals. We have animal behavior experts right here in Texas at some of the finest vet schools who need to do a full impact study of the effect of sound. Um, finally, I say once again, this is a citywide proposal. Uh, I know you reached out to just particular stakeholders, but more meetings like this have to be celebrated so that everybody can be heard. And uh, this, this issue can be fully ventilated before those bond deadlines come up. Understand, we're not naysayers who just want to put this and, and kill this proposal. Obviously, we know Sunken Garden needs to be rehabilitated. But if this were put on pause and a more thorough uh, and broad and expansive impact study was done and citizens were had access to these uh, purported studies, and we could scrutinize them in depth. That's the way to do a meaningful outreach to the community. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. Uh, Frank, did you want to respond to some well, of the- uh, This is Kirk Feldman. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, the uh, first question that was addressed was the, um, the inventory of venues, I believe. And um, we have um, a number of venues in San Antonio, but the truth is the top four, which are the, um, the stadium, the AT&T Center, the uh, real life amphitheater, and the Joe and Harry Freeman Coliseum are all 10,000 or greater in capacity. The real life amphitheater, just for clarity, has 8,000 fixed seats and it has 12,000 uh, lawn seats, so it's a 20,000 seat capacity. And yes, the Tobin Center will do shows out there from time to time. The show that they just announced um, played the AT&T Center last time, and it would never play the Sunken Garden Theater because the capacity is too small. So we are seeking a venue capacity that will allow us to be competitive in, in attracting professional, great touring shows to our community and in doing so, have the ability to book those shows into the venue because of its size. So size is important. An, an artist doesn't wanna to have to play two nights in one market if you can only play one, because time is a commodity for the artist just as well. So we need to be competitive, and, and that's the, in, in principle, the reason why the venue capacity is set in the middle, ordering the lowest venues with the highest venues. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on the next person. Before I do that, I want to remind everyone we are looking at the chat and answering questions in the chat. Um, also, that we have about 180 people on this, and it is already um, 10 minutes to seven. So I just want to remind you to please be as concise as possible in your questions so that we can get to as many people as possible. Um, next, I'm calling on Rasa Salinas. Thank you. Uh, in 25 words, we live in Monta Vista, about two miles from the sunken garden. And when concerts are held there, uh, there is something about the local geology or topography or something that makes it an acoustical horn pointed right at our bedroom. If we go to a larger venue that does concerts 
uh, in the 45 to 60 a year range, I think I'm going to have to move out. So uh, please, when you're talking about noise abatement, look at further than Toledo Street, uh, look at Monta Vista as well. Thank you. Kirk, do you, Kirk, do you want to address that question? Well, the uh, method of addressing it at this stage was to uh, provide uh, for specific improvements. They were enumerated in the video uh, that would serve to contain the sound, keeping in mind that there are none of these improvements today. So it's our goal to, to improve the situation, not to make it worse. And so it is, uh, it is true that the number of events will be larger than uh, in the past, but in order to, um, in order to uh, be able to renovate the theater in a manner which will be self-sustaining, which is important, um, that it keep it from deteriorating once again after an investment, we needed to have the ability to be competitive in, in uh, the entertainment industry attracting the artists to this market that will help drive the economics of the venue. Thank you. Next time we're going to call on Susan Strawn. Thanks. I'm just going to re-ask the question that Mary asked, but I didn't hear an answer, um, which is and goes to the economics of this venue. If the oper if the operator doesn't make enough money, as happened, I guess, with the Alamo Dome and the Toyota Center, um, the Toyota Field, um, who is responsible at that point? Is the city and the county, in other words, the taxpayers, going to have to come in and pay the operating and maintenance costs on this facility? And what are those operating and maintenance costs that you're building into your projections? Thank you, Ms. Strong. This is Frank Bernie. I'll try to answer that question. Um, the city of San Antonio, who owns this facility, is going to sit down with BP BPC if we are able to get full funding and work out the entire process for selecting an operator for this facility. Uh, it may be there are several large international groups that book tours like this. Uh, and part of the agreement that we'll, we will be seeking to negotiate with them is that they will have to cover the full costs for operation and maintenance of the facility on a long-term basis. Um, that's the number one priority of the Breckenridge Park Conservancy, that when we sit down and negotiate it, we want to make sure that there is a, a funding source to take care of this project for uh, its life. And um, that's going to be one of our top priorities in, the, in our negotiations with these operators. We believe that based upon prior experience uh, and other similar situations that the operator will consider this an opportunity to come in uh, and will guarantee those costs, which will uh, reduce the cost for maintaining the facility uh, by the city of San Antonio. Uh, we're also hoping that it'll generate some funds for BPC so we can use the money uh, for other projects in the park, uh, such as historic preservation and other things that are on our, that were identified in the uh, cultural land study. Thank you. Can, you. can you share your projections with us? Of what you project the maintenance and operating costs to be and and whether that is going to be covered by 10 capacity concerts a year, which is what your parking plan says. Frank, I can speak to that. Um, we have not negotiated a deal yet. So the uh, costs will be borne 100% by the operator of the facility. The operator of the facility will have to show financial wherewithal to be able to support the ongoing operating costs in order to be able to get the contract to run the building. So we will have a situation where all those costs uh, will be covered and the city will not have to. Furthermore, uh, we would intend to establish a preservation fund at the theater where a portion of each ticket would go into a fund to ensure the long-term capital maintenance and repair of the facility. Thank you. Um, next, I'm calling on Mimi Quintanilla. Oops. Okay. Um, first, I have three points to make. First, at the presentation to River Road on September 15th, it was stated by a BPC uh, representative that $100,000 to $200,000 would go back to the BPC and the park um, for usage, for the wear and tear that's going on in the park. 
that's actually a pittance that won't even buy enough grass seed to do any good. Um, that in no way mitigates the additional wear and tear on the park. And I don't want to hear that it's not been negotiated because, Mr. Bernie, that's what you stated very clearly at the meeting on September 15th. So you must have that in your mind. It's going to take far more than that to regenerate a park that has already publicly been admitted to be in decline. The additional wear and tear, the additional parking, the additional trash, is going to have a negative impact on the park. And I haven't heard any amount of money that would go back to the Brackenridge Park Conservancy to do its work. 100 to 200,000 is laughable yearly for the kind of usage that's going to be happening. Secondly, and this is a different point, um, the traffic study that was just recently, um, I just recently was able to access um, all of the traffic plans to mitigate any impact on River Road have been tried, uh, and they have been tried over the years using the spring break 2020 as the benchmark is pretty much null and void because COVID had already started. So I would use the one from 2019 and before when, Bracken, when River Road neighbors were not even able to get into our own neighborhood um, because the police wouldn't allow us to come back in. Thirdly, I was on the original tours advisory tours advisory committee, and the priorities there were things like sidewalks, lights, bike lanes, infrastructure, and it seems to me that that is now being um, redirected to the concessions and the tenants in the park, rather than to the more general areas that it was intended to uh, address in the original tours agreement when the citizens got behind that. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Mimi. Um, I'm going to call on Carlos Rodriguez. Thank you very much, and thank you for this event. It, it, it's truly important. I think my question, some of my questions were already formulated and perhaps answered to an extent. And I wish to formulate this question to Councilman Bravo and Councilman McKee Rodriguez, who alluded to the content of my question. And that is that the City Council agenda of Thursday of this week has publicly been, has just been publicized. And it includes an item which relates to the consideration of an ordinance that modifies the composition of the Midtown TERS Board of Directors and amends the TERS project and finance plans. I suspect because the current master plan of the Midtown 31 TERS does not include a redevelopment of the Sunken Garden Theater. And my question is, Will you, Councilman Bravo, and you, Councilman Maki Rodriguez, if in fact you have been given access to the proposed amendments to the TERS project and finance plans that have not been publicized to the residents of San Antonio, will you commit to vote against the proposed ordinance until it assures City Council and the residents of San Antonio that the Midtown Ters Board will include members who are residents of the community within that zone, instead of only city employees and representatives of the Conservancy and the WIT Museum, which is the proposal that is up in the agenda for Thursday. I'll go ahead and address this first. Thank you for your for your question, Carlos. Um, I have yet to be briefed. I'm being briefed tomorrow by city staff on that proposal. Um, you know, one of the things I'm interested in doing is pushing that issue back because um, city council has yet to have a full council wide discussion since the new council members, uh, Councilman McKee Rodriguez, myself, Phyllis Villagran, and Terry Castillo. Since we all got on, council has not had a conversation about what, um, what is the purpose of the tours and how do we measure success? And I'd like to have that conversation before we extend any of the tours. And uh, I don't know that I, I couldn't answer your question as to whether or not there's any potential tours funding for 
uh, being proposed for this project? I'll tell you, I am so, so tentatively, tentatively, I'm supportive of um, the Midtown Tours extension. I'm, I'm supportive of that for a number of the tours. Um, I would be supportive of a delay, and I'll tell you that in conversations that I've had and in briefings I've had about the Midtown Tours, it's not necessarily about an individual project. And I think it's going to be a different kind of tours than one like the inner city tours, where it does require, um, I, I'm not going to say require community stakeholders. I think all of them should, com should require community stakeholders. I'll be clear about that. Um, I think there's going to have to be a conversation about what the makeup of the Midtown tur Tours is because it's going to be going to city owned facilities. It's not going to be the kind where any any random developer can come in and say, oh, I want money for this project. Um, it's going to be specifically for um, these city owned facilities within this boundary. And so I'm I'm even inclined to say that I think there's less room for corruption and exploitation in that way. I don't see a problem with including community members as a part of it. I just think that sometimes, depending on who is appointed, so who is making the appointments to these boards, sometimes that makes it to where, say, I'll say that my predecessor appointed the members of the TERS prior to me. And when I came in, everybody on the inner city TERS was pretty much a developer. That's possible if a council person can decide who's on the on the TERS board. And I don't know if that's, I don't think that's going to be the case with uh, the Midtown TERS. But if a, if a delay is proposed, I will support that. I don't know yet that I can commit to not voting to extend the TERS, because I do still see a need in places like the Weedy Music. It, largely areas in my district that I do think these facilities that are city-owned facilities need the support. I would struggle to vote no but I will be supporting a delay until I can get that kind of, until I can get those commitments and answers from the city. So let me just add, I guess, for clarification, for anyone who didn't know, I just typed into the chat that TER stands for Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone. And so no matter who is made up, whoever is appointed to those TERS, whether there's neighborhood residents or local business owners uh, or you know, uh, city staff, no matter who it, who who's on those TERS, anything that they propose and pass ultimately has to go to city council and be approved. So you always have the opportunity to hold, to uh, have conversations with your council members and hold your council members accountable for anything that any projects that do go through there. I will also add real quick because there was com some of the, there was some conversation about sound and lots of concerns about sound. And um, it's my understanding that we have uh, now have technology that didn't exist, you know, years in the past. That's that sound systems are able to be designed not just with that sound attenuation backboards, but with the actual speakers um, can be designed to contain the sound better. Um, and so it's not you're using speakers that instead of projecting the sound as far as possible, that are directing the sound into a more contained space, so that we should be able to reduce the sound level, no matter the size of the capacity, whether it's the same size capacity or if it's increased, we should be able to reduce the amount of sound. Now, if it's sound of crowds cheering um, at your house, that's not going to change. But if it's the sound, the amplified sound, that should be able to be reduced. And, you know, one thing that we could do is also um, possibly work with the noise whisper who are working with on the noise ordinance sound uh, the noise ordinance sound noise ordinance task force, uh, who has uh, through his work was able to reduce uh, noise complaints in Austin by over seventy percent. And sometimes it was just a simple solution, like at a huge, you know, at a, at a big venue like uh, Stubbs in Austin. Uh, I think they, it was a few thousand there. I think that was two or three thousand people. Um, all they did is they took those tower speakers and they tilted them down towards the ground more. And all of a sudden, neighbors who live very far away were able to were stopped um, making noise complaints because they weren't hearing that sound at their at their house anymore. And so, technology exists to be able to, re to reduce the sound. I think that is one of our easier uh, concerns. These one of the easiest concerns of yours to be able to address. Um, I, I'm really interested in hearing more from. Uh, those who are uh, 
proposing this project about what they're going to do for how many concerts they're going to have a year, um, how many, you know, what, how are they going to handle parking and traffic congestion? So thank you. Could I ask a question? Um, I'm I'm going through and uh, calling on people who've raised their hand. Um, I'm not sure who was just speaking, but um, I, we have a queue going. And so the next person I was going to call on is Michael Marchbanks. Thank you very much. This is Michael Marchbanks. I'm actually not going to be speaking quite as long because I just found out the traffic study was released and I haven't had time to look at it. My issues is with this is one from taxpayer dollars and everything else. And many people have mentioned Red Rocks, including I, of, but it's much further away. But my concern, I think, was really addressed by Mimi as well, is we have seen in spring breaks, Easter, and everything else, incredible traffic backing up on the 281 north and southbound. And this is, doesn't impact just us areas. People that have to go from one side of the city to the other now have to go to Bassey or down to Grayson to cut across and get around anytime there's a major event. And any of these events, they are basically blocking the things up. You can't get through. Even if you can get to the neighborhood, you can't get through. And the ingress and egress just do not allow it from an engineering point of view. There's only two lanes, you know, one each direction. And all the parking lots, there's really one way up, this way sideways, and that. There's really only two ways you can get into these things. And since the parking lots that you're talking about are in series, you know, you get somebody to come into this one, it's going to back up so they can't get to the next one. AT&T works because they have multiple lanes to get it around there. They also have wide lanes where you can get people in multiple ones. The parking lots are not set the same. Most parking lots can take a maximum of 600 people if they have prepaid parking. That's 10 a second. And see, if you look at the, what's going on now, it just doesn't work. I don't see, and I'm having to look at your traffic today, I don't see how those numbers can work. Uh, even just this last um, um, uh, Martin Luther King Day, when we had the zoo had their little special because of uh, Betty White dying, we could not get across onto uh, Hildebrand from Mulberry because it was totally blocked up with people. And that's people going to an all day event. This is stretched out all day. The zoo takes a maximum of nine or 10,000 people a, a day. They don't even reach it during spring break when it backs up on the highways. And that again, it's all day. It's not complying and it's into one to two hours. I just don't see from an engineering point of view or any kind of design point of view how you can do it because police don't work, the traffic designs don't work, and you're going to be really hurting a lot of people on this one. I just, like I said, noise, debatement, I believe in renovation, but it just, this kind of venue at this size, it's, we don't have the infrastructure in place for it. And like I said, I'll look at this traffic study and, and comment again, but you can't base it on the COVID time periods. You have to base it on something before, and anybody that says otherwise, we're going to be eating it. And basically, the people that are designing this, lives, because we've had wrecks from that road rage and everything else. If you do this on steroids, it's like this whole Easter, spring break, and everything else like that, that huge traffic on steroids. And I don't want to be some two things, but I just, you know, it's really going to affect that. And that's assuming there are no other events. So that means no other events at the, at the zoo at nighttime events, nothing going on at San Antonio Stadium. There's just not the infrastructure there in place for this kind of venue at that kind of concentration, in my opinion. But again, like I said, I'll look at the study again and run the numbers, but just looking at it, you just can't make the comparison. Thank you. Uh, this is Rose Hill from District 2. What I'd like to say uh, to everybody is that not only is this going to affect District 1, it's going to affect District 2, Mankey Park, Government Hill, and West Ford because a lot of those people are going to be coming through our neighborhoods and it's already our neighborhoods already packed with a lot of development already in our neighborhood and that really needs to be taken into consideration more community input really is needed here on how it's going to affect all 10 districts because we all use that park you utilize it we know that the amphitheater needs help uh of rehabilitation that is that's a number number one key factor but again, community input is important because we, we're also not taking into consideration those poor families that are low, on low income that come into the park to bring their children in there. How are they going to get in and out with all these venues? So I want the, the, both councilmen, uh, District 1 and District 2, to take that into consideration. We're talking about people, people that have, uh, that are, um, and not revenue, but people that are coming to that park uh, to enjoy their families. That really needs to be taken into consideration and more community input. If this does go through, 
get more community input and get more uh, feedback out there because that's not ha that's not happening here. And we should not let this pass through city council without getting more community input. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to call on Mary Johnson. Thank you. I'm so glad we're having this meeting. Um, this project, without a doubt, needs to be scaled back. Um, most people don't understand that a bond is funded from property taxes. So all I see is escalating property taxes and rising rents. So get that point out of the way. Another point is that when I was in the bond committee hearing, our neighborhood presented and many other neighborhoods presented because we have severe flooding issues. So we were told that, no, we didn't get the money and we could go seek the money somewhere else. So I guess I'm gonna turn that back on this. It's like, let them go seek the money somewhere else and let's use that money to, to fix up our flooding uh, neighborhoods now. Um, I just don't get, you know, all of our neighborhoods that are on here speaking to these problems that are gonna be caused by this giant venue, we know our areas, we know our neighborhoods, we know where the stress points are, and this is not going to work in this size and scale. Um, when I was listening to the uh, NPR show on it today, the people that were on there, I didn't catch your names, but they were so condescending, they made it sound like River Road was the only neighborhood about, you know, what, 200 people, they were the only ones that were upset. Well, all of our inner city neighborhoods that are around this are gonna be affected by it. And we're all angry and upset that we haven't been asked about anything concerning this. And this, you know, Michael brought up those points about the emergency, you know, what about the emergency vehicles getting through there? This is just, um, all I see is, another taxpayer albatross around our necks. And it's ironic that we have two noise ordinances going right now. And here we are planning our city management and mayor and councilor are planning this. And it's like, it, it's almost like y'all are tone deaf, you know, pardon the pun. It's like, we're trying to fix a noise that we already have and a crowd, you know, I understand, okay, there's new technology, but the crowd and the crowd noise are a huge part of the problem. St. Mary's is a mess right now. And, you know, let, let's fix those problems before we go creating another one. Thank you, Mary. Um, I want to remind everyone, I'm just going to do a quick time check at 7.15. I want to remind you to please keep your comments as concise as possible so we can continue to um, hear from everyone. The next person that had their hand raised was Grace Rose Gonzalez. Everyone, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Grace. Grace, we can't hear you anymore. Well, can you? Yes. Somebody, okay. We can hear you now. Okay. So, um, a couple of things. One, I was uh, I was at one point I was on a bond committee. Uh, the last bond, I think it was what 2017, 20. I can't remember the one prior to this one. And the reality, when we sat on the bond as a bond committee member, one of the questions was was it shovel ready, right? And that was a that was a term that we were using a lot about bonds, uh, bond projects that were in front of us. Which meant, had they gone through the vetting? Did they have the funding? Did they have all the partnerships? Did they have, there was like a checklist and a matrix that we went through to make sure that it was a viable project. This one that tells me that you're asking for 5 million and then you still need 25 million from Bear County, 13 million is outstanding. And all of this other, it, you know, it's like, well, it's like, it's too nebulous. Not to, not to mention, that it wasn't vetted by neighborhoods. Not to mention that the, the plans are just, you know, just outrageously big for the, for the scale. Yes, it needs renovation. What can we get for 5 million? What can we do for 5 million? Maybe this project needs to be phased. This is the kind of conversation that we would have had on the bond committee, 
Like, can we phase this project? Did they do their due diligence? Where are the letters of support? We always had letters of support. I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing any support here. I will tell you that there's a petition of 1,500 people that signed uh, that the, the Brown Berets put up saying that this is, you know, this is not a good project, um, you know, because it hasn't been vetted. So I'm just, I'm just going to go back to saying, where can we, where can we recover this and maybe phase a project, maybe take the things that need to be fixed and get those things fixed and upgraded and then look at what we can do later. But right now there's, there, I, I know that there was a $41 million project that the link project downtown that the county had already put money in and it got zero dollars on the bond as matching and i think they were only asking for five so here we have no dollars but we're going to give them five and we have 41 million dollars and we don't give them anything so i, I as a bond as as a past bond committee member i can't reconcile all of that i really don't and that's all i have to say thank you Thank you. Um, can next can I just address real quick that my understanding from the city manager's office is that if this issue, if this issue is approved and put on the bond and approved by the voters, that city staff are going to write the bond language such that if um, if the Brackenridge Park Conservancy doesn't raise all of the money for this project, that that they're not going to get a penny of this five million dollars, so that they have to raise their end of the deal first. That you know, and that's that's a good safeguard. But you know, one one thing is, why don't we have that that uh, safeguard up front? Why don't we have the money up front and see what we can do, or scope a project that does that does renovate what we need to do because it's deteriorating and we know it. I mean, it's not like none of us know it. Um, all the city council districts use that, um, and like I said, one thousand five hundred people. Um, signed that petition. There was quite a lot of people that have, um, otherwise we wouldn't have had this venue that you all put together only before, only because of the pushback. Those, I would say, and I'm going to say it as a past bond committee member, they didn't do their due diligence and ask the right questions. And those are the questions I would have asked had I been on that bond committee. Thank you. Thank you, Grace Rose. Uh, Councilman McKee Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, there are some questions that I keep seeing repeated in the chat that I'm not hearing um, answers for necessarily. Um, number one, what design reviews have been done and what room is there for continued review of design and community engagement? Um, Councilman, this is Nick Hollis, uh, the uh, chair of the Brackenridge Conservancy. Um, again, thank you for convening this. Um, I think the thing that I'm taking away from this or the thing that is reality is listening to what Razi had to say. He went through about, I think, 2,300 different steps uh, before this thing ever gets built. Um, and I think there's a lot of work that needs to go into what's going on here. But in order to front up for the bond dollars, as the previous uh, uh, person just think, um, described, you've actually got to come with some concepts. Um, so the reality here is I think we've got an awful long way to go, uh, both in funding terms, I think in terms of community engagement. Um, and I laud both of you for pulling this opportunity together to get people um, discussing things. One thing that I would ask, can people ask questions rather than make comments? And then to your, uh, your point, Councilman, we can start answering the questions as opposed to just dealing with people's comments. So. It, can we do that? And then, then we can possibly get to the root of some of these issues that are important to everybody. Thank you, I appreciate that. So what I heard was that um, in order for something like this to happen, you have to come with some sort of design, but it is not the final design and there is a lot of room for growth and change and community engagement. That's what I heard, is that accurate? That's absolutely correct. As I said, we are so early in this, um, it's it, it, this, this thing is most probably not done to 25, 26. Um, and we've got a, a many, many milestones that we have to make. And frankly, um, it, it's, this is a, a great start to get this, all the stuff, get it out and aired, 
Um, but there are many, many more steps that the city has in place to make sure that projects just don't get rushed through. The other comment that I would make, we keep using the term developer. Brackenridge Park is not a developer. We are not a, a for-profit organization that's out there looking to make a buck. We are working with the city of San Antonio. We are working with the, with the, um, the office of the, of, the, of the manager, we're working with the parks department. We're now engaging, um, now that we're closer to sort of a, a, a commitment on a bond, we're engaging with the public. We're putting out all of the studies that we have. We're working together to try and move something forward on behalf of the city and the citizens of San Antonio. We are not a developer, a nonprofit with our goal in mind is to give the best possible use of that facility to everyone in this community for years to come. Thank you. I appreciate Anish, it. I'll keep Anish, it in uh, this is, this is Rezi. Let me add a little bit of regarding the shovel ready project. Project this size, you don't want to really make shovel ready for many reasons. First of all, you don't know if city is going to fund this one. Secondly, you don't know if they're going to fund, how much they're going to fund. Thirdly, you really don't know also bond is going to be passed. Project this size, you have some rendering to start a conversation and they have done so far. Well, I, uh, Rosie, I, I agree with you, but disagree excuse because- I'm sorry, excuse me, Grace Rose. We have about five or six more people in the queue with their hands up and it's already- I know, uh, but I just want to just address that show already. And so we this, need to let others okay. have a chance to speak. But a project this large should have had more homework. That's all. Thank you. Real quick, before we move on to the next set of people, um, one of the things that I'm going to be asking you for that I'm looking for is going to be um, another set of plans that include a, redu a reduction in size. I think that's something that we hear very consistently right now is that people feel that one, the renderings do not show an accurate portrayal of what it is that is going to be developed. Um, and so I want to know that what we're looking at is what we're getting. Um, and what that sounds like to me is that what people want is less less capacity um i would like to know about the parking situation travel what accommodations need to be made as far as infrastructure goes what the city's plan is because infrastructure is a part of the bond and i want to see what master plan exists as it relates to that um, because parking and travel and the danger that exists when you have uh, a lot of vehicles on the road has now been uh brought up a number of times as well as sound um the third bit is design review um, I would like to know if there was a, if there was a historical design expert who was a part of the design and um, what feedback someone like that would provide. Um, but that's a few of the things. I also would like to see a set of um, future dates being being saved pretty much for continued engagement. I don't want this to be the last time, and I don't want everyone to think this is over the day a vote happens, whether it's a no or a yes. Sheila, do you want those answered right now, or do you want us to send you a written response? Um, let's get those answers now so people can hear it. Okay. Uh, as to historic, uh, obviously, we have consulted with historic uh, folks. Our architect is in the middle of rebuilding a down around, uh, beautiful downtown theater uh, on the Riverwalk uh, and has, has a lot of experience with historic adaptations. Uh, we realize that we're going to have to go through the city's HDRC and HPO as the city property. Uh, we'll have to satisfy uh, all of their concerns as well as uh, the Texas Historic Commission uh, because this is on the uh, list of historic places. And so we'll have to go to THC as well to get their approval for this project. Um, I think we've made it very clear we're in the preliminary stages of this project. And you, it's kind of a chicken egg. You've got to start with some plan. So you have an idea of what kind of budget you're going to have and what will work there. Uh, and that's where we are in this process. And as Chairman Nick just mentioned, we welcome all the input we can get on this project. We want it to be a win-win for the community uh, and something that everybody treasures. So uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be glad to provide you all any information you need. Thank you. And I'm so sorry to continue to hog. Can you also please reiterate what you've heard from the people here today? Um, the concerns that have been brought up, the changes that have uh, that people are asking for and the concerns that you hear that you think are most pressing? Uh, do you have several hours? <laughs> no, just serious. 
Uh, obviously, we are worried about, I mean, the things, the same things we've been hearing are th the exact same things that Rutgers Park Services has been focusing on. Noise impact, traffic impact, uh, how to get people in and out of that facility. Is it too, is, this, is the size of the project too large uh, for this project, okay? Is it too large for Rutgers Park? Those same issues, uh, the Rutgers Park Conservancy has been working through them for several years to try to come up with the best possible plan. Um, and we, we encourage uh, everyone to provide more input uh, to us so we can have a, a project that everybody celebrates. Thank you. Um, we have about five or six more people queued up uh, that had raised their hands. Uh, it is 727. I don't want to cut us off, so I'm going to ask that um, once I call on you, if you have a question, please state your question. Um, and if if you just want to share your concerns, I would prefer if you put it in the chat, that would be more helpful so that we can um, address that uh, afterward. But a direct question is going to be probably most time um, conscientious right now. Next is Margaret Leeds. Uh, I have a question, uh, would the venue be designated an entertainment center with an 85 decibel allowance? At this particular point in time, it's premature for us to even think about that. We've got to do some, we've got to do the noise studies. We have a benchmark at the moment of what the current theater does, and then we have to see how the new theater or projections um, or digital projections on what that looks like in terms of keeping it under those levels or at levels that sit inside the current ordinance today. Um, as far as future ordinance is concerned, they would need to be negotiated um, with the community. Otherwise, this whole, this whole thing won't work if the theater cannot operate within the noise envelope that the citizens of San Antonio are prepared to deal with. Thank you. I see that there, you know, we are at the, the end of the meeting, but there are over 161 people, there are 161 participants still on here. I'm willing to stay and hear more of your questions and concerns. If, you know, I don't know if uh, members of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy are willing to, but if not, I'm willing to stay here and be able to continue to document your questions and concerns just to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask a question. Uh yeah, Mario, I'm more than happy to sit here. I've been working on this thing with the Brackenridge Conservancy in the city for almost four years. So um, a few hours here uh, working with the citizens of San Antonio is, uh, is something we'd be very, very engaged in. And the more we learn today, the better off we'll be in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I have next on the list, Blanquita Sullivan. Hi, everyone. Um, one of the um, concerns that I have is the frequency of events. So we're talking about two to three events per week uh, at a minimum between April and October. And, you know, a lot of the concerns that have been listed and people have brought forward, I think, um, are concerns that uh, those of us that live in the surrounding area can, can live with if it's every once in a while but two to three times a week um, is, it's it's not something that we can really live with. It's just so many events. And I, so my question is really, um, what would it take to reduce that number? Um, and I know there's concerns about the financial viability of this venue. Um, I think that it was stated that it um, the venue needed 60, 48 to 60 events per year to make it financially viable, which I think is concerning. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, what happens if that target isn't um, achieved. But um, could you talk a little bit about the frequency of events um, and how, um, how concerned is everyone uh, about that number? And also, um, what does this mean for the uh, inequity issues that this creates within the city? Um, we have a cultural heritage to protect. There are low-income park visitors who 
would not be able to visit the park the way that they do now with uh, relative ease because there would be limited parking, limited access for them two to three times a week. And during daylight savings hours, that in includes daytime hours for them. So if, um, if you could please talk a little bit about that, I I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask Kurt to do that. But as far as the your last comment, Blakita, most people aren't taking their children to the park at eight and nine o'clock at night. Um, the the nature of these shows is they're going to be the, the parking. We're trying to obviously integrate with the, our visitors during the day. And this is our visitors later on in the evening. So in terms of crowding out the existing uh, visitors to the park, I, I think with as many spaces as the parking plan has defined, that we're in good shape there. I think that's something that we can all feel confident in. Um, as to the, the mechanics and the, and the financial aspects of running a theater, I, I'm going to kick that over to Kirk right now. He can field that question. Sure. With regards to the number of events, we provided a range um, because we were looking at the activity levels in other markets uh, in Texas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio. And um, we were looking at the investment that was going to come from the private sector. And we wanted to be able to represent to the state and to the nation that this was really one of the top tier venues in the nation. And um, so the variety and the quantity of events um, and the genres of those events all feed that narrative. And so it needs to draw a wide variety of attractions so that someone from every council district can say, you know what, I love going there. It's a great venue. And not only that, but we need to be able to attract the shows to fill that schedule. So that's basically where the 48 to 60 came from. Could it operate slightly less or more? Market conditions will dictate that. And, um, and I would think that that would be a flexible number we could expect to see vary from year to year based on the activity in the industry. Right. I think one of the other concerns that I keep hearing is that we don't want to lumber the taxpayers of uh, San Antonio with a failing venture. Can you describe the um, study that was done in order to um, establish that this, in fact, would be a popular and financially sound venture? Um, well, in, at a very high level, uh, the uh, study indicated that, yes, in fact, the venue could be self-sustaining. Now, self-sustaining means it doesn't carry any debt in operations. So the operator would have his own debt to carry, but the, ven the venue would be made um, and constructed so that there was no ongoing debt service requirement. Uh, beyond that, the uh, operator would be involved with paying rent to the conservancy, and the rent we discussed earlier would go towards things like um, helping defray some of the costs and also helping fund some other projects. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Lori Abney, is he, are you raising your hand? <laughs> um, yes, so I, I guess my question is for Nick. Um, have you all been in contact with the Center for Conservation and, and Research in the, with the San Antonio Zoo? I know it's Becky Mosher Hodges, who's the manager for that center. Have you had communications with her on how this will impact the animals in the zoo? Uh, no, we've spoken, um, well, I guess with her boss. Um, and uh, I think he came out publicly recently in an article I saw suggesting this will have little to no impact on the animals at the zoo. What is his name? I'm sorry. Lori, I, let me just interrupt real quick. I saw that Tim Morrow, uh, who's CEO or executive director of the zoo, was on earlier. Tim, are you still with us? He's not, but Frank Ruttenberg is. He's the current chairman of the zoo. Do we um, Frank, Frank would you would you like to field that? Certainly, yeah. I, I've asked these same questions of uh, Tim Morrow, and and uh, to the, the young lady who was speaking, that uh, Tim is the is the executive director of the zoo, uh, and he has indicated to me that he's spoken with all of our animal care specialists. It should have no impact whatsoever on the animal on the animals and the animal care. Okay. At what time will concerts end? Have we anyone mentioned that? 
Frank is, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, Frank. Um, do you want to handle that? Um, I presume you mean Frank Bernie. Yeah, Frank, you want yeah. to handle <laughs> Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, let me try to answer it. I mean, you're talking about um, certain times of year, you're not going to be able to have events. You know, you're not going to have it during the middle of January, more than likely. You may not even be able to have it in, uh, in August, if it gets too hot, uh, in September and October, you, you want to try to avoid any conflicts with Alamo Stadium. And so it depends in terms of the hours of operation. It depends on what time of the year you're going to have the event. Uh, I would anticipate, you know, that sometimes events might start, uh, depending on what kind of concert it is, it may start at 6 or 7. Others will start at 8. Uh, but every, the events will, will change throughout the year, depending upon the weather and, the, and, and how, you know, what, what, what the anticipated, uh, you know what it's going to be like at that point in time when you start. I didn't hear an end time though. Just just for the record, I didn't hear an end time. Okay, can, can you help with that then? You're so, uh, I believe ten thirty. It's a standard you'd find fairly consistently across the state of Texas. I'm sorry. Um, was that ten o'clock? Ten thirty. Ten thirty. Okay. Thank you. And and on the conservation with the zoo, where can we find out more about that? Um, is it Tim Morrow? Uh, who would be in charge of that, Mr. Bravo? Or I, I would like to know more in, in, in more detail how who, how it's not going to impact our animals. That would be Tim Morrow. Yes. Okay. I guess I'll have to find. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. If you want to send me or any of our staff members in the private chat your email address, we can try to get you contact information for the zoo and send it to you. I'm in contact with Becky Mosher Hodges. She's uh, the manager, but I guess Tim is the main. Okay, thank you. Lori, I have your email address, of course, as well. So I'm happy to connect you. Thank you. Um, next on uh, in the queue, I have um, Rumor Rumi or Rumor Romy. Is that someone's yes, so screen name? Hello, that's me. Okay, I can hear you. Hello. Uh, I live in about San Pedro Park Springs area. And just, we're coming out of COVID-19, just barely. And we have so much homelessness going on in the city. And just going downtown or near the Brackenbridge area, you can see people that are hungry out in the cold right now. And the fact that our city hasn't done anything to help with that, but we're putting so much money and infrastructure for an amphitheater that so many people do not want happening just for tourist dollars is very pathetic and very sad i don't really have a question just really well comment. thank you yeah you ha you don't have a question thank you bye thank you um i think i see david leal are you raising your hand yeah, I live in Monte Vista, and my question has been a little bit answered, a little bit about the, the uh, design of the project is, you know, this was originally the, a Japanese tea house or Japanese site gardens, and I don't see any more gardens anymore. You know, and it looks like, you know, we have, this is the only uh, uh, building or, or place that I know that has any kind of Japanese culture. And so I, I think we should need to, we need to preserve what the, you know, the original family, you know, they ended up uh, taking it away from the original business. And then when I was a when I was a boy, it was uh, they changed the name to the Chinese Second Garden, and so the I think it's very important that we keep it pretty much the way it is. Keep the gardens as the as an historical uh, uh, structure, you know. Uh, and so, are you, are you going to change the design to include uh, a Japanese minimally Japanese architecture in, into the what you're doing? Are you put the gardens back in? David, just a point. You're talking about the Japanese tea garden, which is in the next quarry over. That we, we have, we're not having anything to do with changing the tea garden. This particular facility never hosted the tea garden and was not any in any way, shape, or form a, a Japanese art form. Uh, it was a, it was an open air theater in the other um, in the other quarry that existed next to the Japanese tea garden. So. Please do not be concerned that we're going to be impacting the tea garden. Well, the, the, I've never, I've never heard of this this other this other uh, auditorium. But what, in what shape is the is the uh, original Japanese tea house or garden? 
Yeah. The tea garden has been renovated and it's in fabulous shape. And, and I would encourage you to um, take a trip in there. It's, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Well, it's, it's still with me the idea to try to get some, at least some, some kind of cultural thing into the architecture rather than having it like any other building that you have in the, across the United States. Well, the goal, the goal of the, the, uh, the mass timber roof and, and the organic nature of that roof rather than hard structures and steel it is a nod to what you're describing. Uh, and that's, that was what the architect's intent was. And I think if you look at the lighting uh, in the reds and the hues, uh, which speak to the Japanese lanterns and things, we, we were conscious of wanting to speak to the, as I said, to the Japanese garden, which is in the, in the quarry next door. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Bianca Maldonado. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question and provide some comments. I guess my first question really goes to city staff on this because this is designated a citywide project, yet there has not been, in my opinion, citywide public input. So how do you classify a citywide project? Is it just based on potentially anybody citywide would attend an event um, in this location? And then my second question is, um, when you develop a project from a staff recommendation, historically park uh, projects go through the city's park committee so that they're publicly vetted and there's the opportunity to provide public input so we could have a robust public discussion of over 180 people before it becomes a staff recommendation. And all this information would be more publicly available. Um, what are the steps the city has taken to ensure that there's a public input component prior to the bond? I guess that's my second question. And my third question is, at what point does the city decide that they're gonna attend a press conference to announce a project before it had the opportunity for public input for the bond cycle? Um, that's my third question. And my fourth question is, what studies has the city done for infrastructure? There's so much that's being done for Vision Zero and PED mobility and uh, safety of individuals entering and exiting this park, and specifically mobility within the park is the question for the conservancy for safety uh, purposes. And then my last and final comment, uh, would be the perfect storm, would be when SAISD has an event, the zoo has an event, and there's a public concert going on. Um, imagine the life safety issue you pose to the surrounding neighborhoods who would not be able to have fire and EMS access. Thank you. Okay, Bianca, so I'll start with five, and I think the city can answer the prior four. Um, we're going to be scheduling around both the zoo and the Alamo Stadium. Um, to your point, we certainly, um, from the um, from the patrons' point of view, we, we don't want those clashes because it's it's going to deter from their enjoyment of what's going on as well. So that's why the the numbers of um, events are limited to what we've described. I did the math the other day. There is eighty percent of the time, assuming we had fifty paid for events and 25 community events, a total of 75 events of which 25 are community, would represent that the theater is empty 80% of the time. So Razi, could you possibly handle the other four in terms of um, the community process by which the city makes its decisions? Unfortunately, Razi had to leave at 7.30, but Rogelio, uh is on the call from Public Works and he should be able to answer those questions. Rogelio, are you there? Okay. Um, we looks like we lost our public works uh, representative. Can Thanks just... for taking my questions. I do appreciate it. I just yeah. think there is a clear um, concern with process and procedure. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, I do want to um, just remind everyone that there was opportunity for public input during the bond process. 
um, at the bond meetings as well as um, our office hosted a town hall. I know the D2 office also hosted a town hall. Um, so I wanna reiterate that. And Bianca, we have your questions and we will um, provide answers to you. I can give them to you directly. And then um, we will also be compiling um, a list that will try to answer as many questions and address as many concerns as possible that we will send out to everyone. So thank you. Uh, next for um, to speak is Graciela. Hi, my name is Graciela Sanchez and I uh, am one of the 30 bond members in the parks uh, uh, section this past year. So um, I also want to say that as the director of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, we have used Sunken Gardens to coll collaboratively in 1990 to bring in Tracy Chapman and in 2009 to bring in Leela Downs. And I love that Sunken Gardens theater. And I, and while using it and before and after, you know, I desire for that theater to be renovated. And I would love it to be done in the way that the Japanese gardens was renovated that really didn't sh change out the whole thing. And I also wanted to say that this process for the bond was shorter than the 2017 bond. I think we had a whole month less and we were angry because we, you know, we didn't get started until mid-October or late October. Um, and I also want to let you know that the D District 5 representatives all voted to zero out the Sunken Garden Theater uh, proposal, as did other districts. But we were, there was pushback from city staff, and we were told essentially that there was no way it was going to go to zero, that this was a city uh, facility, and so there would be many. But I do think because of the pushback from many of the bond members, it went from 10 million to 5 million. So it was the only bond parks project that came before the bond committee with any, with people speaking out against it. All other folks came in speaking loudly to support their projects. This was the only one that got negative. And of course, there were a few people that spoke, but many more comments um, in the speak, whatever it's called, speak up. So, you know, I, I just, you know, all those questions from the, the arch, architectural design, I mean, I saw it on this, in the newspaper and I hated it. And I said it in front of everybody in that bond committee. And I think even the chairs of the bond committee, who's an architect also dis, did not like it, but all the concerns you had around traffic, around tearing down of, you know, cutting down of trees, um, just Rossi, something that's been raised. So I just wanted to be very clear that many of us were against it as well, and we heard you. And so I just wanted to state that. Do you have a question, Graciela, that we, we can answer for you? Have you become the moderator? Don't be assholes, okay? Sorry? Um, excuse me. Uh, we are also taking comments in addition to questions. So... Um, there's no need to moderate that outside of our process. Um, I had a couple more people in the queue. Um, I had Raleigh Wood. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you now, Raleigh. Thank you. Uh yeah, I, I just want to I'll be real brief. I, I'm a past chair of the River Road Neighborhood Association, and I have been involved in the traffic planning for Easter and uh, spring break and with the zoo and parks and uh, city and council people. And it does not always go smoothly. And um, I think that it does cause problems. And there are things that you just it's a lot to control for. There could be an event at the Alamo Dome. The police are called away. You know, there's just a lot of factors, uh, and I just think that with uh, the existing parking, you can't assume that it's all going to be empty, you know, and it's so diverse. There's not a centralized area of parking, and I just don't see, and I'm, I'm all for renovation of the theater, but I just don't see how <laughs> with the existing parking and infrastructure, it could, you know, hold a, a 
support a 7,000 uh, person theater. And that's that's basically what I wanted to say. And I guess thank the Conservancy for being here. And then I do think I looked briefly today, this morning at the uh, special uh, event assessment that I had someone gave me. And uh, I would like to say that I think that the noise does need further study, and I would certainly like the neighborhood to be involved if that's when that's done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raleigh. Um, I had Lucy Wilson next. I just wanted to make a comment. <clears throat> I didn't realize how special we were when we were invited to uh, host uh, the unveiling of this in our neighborhood back in September. We started trying in August and everyone's schedule didn't work. We always bring things to our whole neighborhood. So we tried to have it on a board meeting night and that didn't work. So we had it another time. But what I realized was that after, not too long after it began to become evident that we were the only neighborhood that had been uh, privileged to have the presentation made to us. And so we began to share uh, with uh, Monte Vista and some other neighborhoods, the fact that, you know, we had detailed information beyond what was just appearing in the newspaper. And so um, I think we had the privilege of beginning to uh, have some public uh, input begin to happen. And I just, uh, I just think that something's wrong when we don't give people an opportunity to know what's happening that's going to really impact their lives. And, and I really appreciate the councilman having this, this opportunity for people to exchange ideas tonight. I think it's critical, critical uh, to the success of anything that we do commun uh, in, in our public places. Oftentimes you hear Brackenridge Park described as sacred ground, and it is for so many people. And we have to honor sacred ground by also honoring the people that make it sacred as well as the environment. And that's been River Road's purpose ever since we were incorporated. Our, our commitment was to the park and to the neighborhoods, not just our own. Thank you for hearing me. I want, I want to hop in real quick and address some things that uh, Graciela and Lucy had mentioned. And, you know, you were talking about, you know, you, you all did say things about how this park is special and about people who've musicians who've come and play there in the past. And I, I wanted to let, share with you all that the very first concert I ever remember going to in my life was to see Santana at, uh, at Sunken Garden Theater. When I, my parents took me when I was a kid and I remember that uh, the smoke smelled a little funny there at that concert. So some of you more senior participants in this uh, who may have been there, you weren't smoking cigarettes. Um, but uh, Graciela also um, mentioned that this has been a shorter process than previous bonds. You're, that's true. Uh, and I was talking to somebody about that previously, and they were saying, you know, the city has gotten a late start this time on doing the bond process. And there are people who are very concerned that uh, you know, if we don't move fast enough, we won't be able to, they won't be able to uh, put it on the ballot and be able to, um, you know, get information out to the voters in, in order to be able to pass the bond. And so that's, that's something, I think that's a factor that's maybe driving this at the pace that it is. I think it's really important that, that we're hearing from you all tonight and continue to hear from you all wherever we end up, you know, uh, whether this doesn't end up on the bond or whether it, it, you know, whether it does or doesn't to make sure that your voice is heard in shaping uh, what is the, what we can come to a, for consensus on what should be an appropriate project here. Uh, then finally, I just want to say that somebody, uh, there was some discussion in the chat about appointees and who did Councilman McKee Rodriguez and I appoint and whether or not they voted for this project or not to, to put, keep this project on the bond. I, I can say for myself that I didn't give any direction to my bond appointees. We spent a lot of time trying to get, make sure that we had a diverse group of appointees and that brought a lot of different things to, to the table. 
and then we let them do their thing. Because if I, as the council member, was giving uh, the citizen uh, committee members uh, marching orders, then there's no sense in having a public input process. And so I just wanted to point that out and I'll hand it back over to Anissa. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I only see a couple more hands up uh, from folks who have already spoken. Did you have any other, you know, short comments that you wanted to sh to to share, or are those raised hands left over from before? Um, I I just see Mary and Susan, Mary Sandoval and Susan Strong. So I just had one brief um, question, which is whether or not uh, a lot of people in the chat have been commenting on how misleading or how. The uh, renderings don't show a 5,900 seat facility, and we did notice that there was a site plan in the video. Could we get a copy of that site plan? And so we could see actually the overlay of, of how this facility is going to fit in the site. And just for your information, if you can see me over my shoulder, this is, I could share my screen, but this is an overlay of the 5,900 foot, 5,900 seat uh, Greek theater in LA with sunken gardens with no lawn and you can see that it fills the entire space out to the you know out to the end of sunken gardens so I just I point this out only to say that I'm concerned that we are going to have a huge facility that is fixed seating and very little lawn space to have these other events that we've been talking about or to see people who want to sit on the lawn and um, you know, have less expensive tickets for the lawn. That's all. My name is Alicia Garlock, and I I can't do the, the raising the hand thing. I tried to do it earlier, but I did have a question uh, on for the conservancy or everyone actually on when are they going to actually include the public in the decisions that they are making because. There seems to be a norm of things like that. It comes out after the fact. The river wall, the trees that are going to be taken down 80 to 100% of the heritage oaks. We barely got the plan, the agenda this. Well, I got it today. So, but nobody knows that they're going to take out all those heritage oaks. They say to fix the wall, but also if you've been in the park over the last week, they've been removing trees and vegetation. That is meant as an effort to deter the egrets and herons from nesting. The other plan is that they want to have the USDA come into our city parks, actually citywide, and destroy nests with viable eggs and possibly kill some birds. And nobody knows about it because our parks isn't talking to people. And the conservancy, if they're over the parks and stewards of the parks, what I've seen over the last five years is neglect of the park. The bathroom by the PlayStation, or what is it? The ball field has holes in the roof and then the, the wood is rotting. There was steps on the footbridge that were cracked and finally they fell over and they fixed it after a year, two years. Uh, you have flooding during, during rainstorms that comes over the sidewalks, you know, along the river. There are, um, repairs that should be like a daily thing like come on we, we we fix our house when we find things that are broken but it you talk about the park is in disrepair but you've been there for how many years and you've watched i'm watching or we're watching as nature is being destroyed you want to chase away the egrets and the herons which four of which need conservation are we looking at things like this are we involving the public in decisions in our parks that will affect the quality of life will affect our wildlife will affect the environment and the public because we're all connected we share in the web of life and so i would like to know when is well the conservancy is going to include the public before the fact not after the fact like it seems this is going on and and also with our parks and our council people the public needs to be involved in actions that will impact our environment in our parks. You know, you say that's not going to affect the animals. Animals are sensitive to noise. You might research some of how their noise like, sounds to them. Uh, people are going to be, you know, more people, more trash. It, it, there's going to be an impact. 
to say that altering the habitat is not going to affect anybody is kind of like not really very realistic. But also, if you're talking about keeping the historical value of the park, you would keep some of the historical, you know, the the walls or whatever. But you're trying to alter stuff to make it modern, but that's great to an extent, but how can it be a historical park if you're altering the footprint? So why are you going to going forward change the way you do things and include the public and not hide stuff? Because when I asked in November for the plans for the river wall, you all said, ask the parks people, but you are the stewards of the park. Are you going to start talking to the public and sharing the plans that people are asking for in advance so that we have a a understanding of everything, not just, you know, one side, every when you when you share stuff or you research stuff or you try to work with the public, it needs to be both sides, everything. You know, we can hear the good and the bad, but it gives us the option to make a decision based on facts, research and an environmental assessment. Things like that should happen before the fact, not after. Ms. Garlock, my name is Frank Burney. Uh, I have heard, I've been involved in most discussions. I've never heard any discussion about destruction of any trees. I'd also yeah, they've been cutting that. trees all week for the last three weeks. I actually have the photos and the video. Let, let me finish. It. And, and secondly, this is, this is city property. Nothing can be done on this property without the city of San Antonio approving it. And so I'm certain that, that the city is going to require that any construction comply with its existing ordinances and they have to give approval for any type of plans on this property. Councilman McKee Rodriguez, I saw that you raised your hand. Yes, thank you so much. I do have to um, get ready to go in a second, um, but I wanted to, I feel as though I have an obligation to share where I'm at at the moment and what I think the path forward is. Um, and what lens through which I'll be making a decision in a couple of weeks. And I think um, number one, big goal is gonna be making sure that the bond passes. I've said that from the get go, we want something, we want as many people to feel confident in the bond as possible. We want people to feel as though the bond and something that they're paying into is going to be benefiting their community. And I want as little outrage as possible. I, I just want that to be clear. So when we were having conversations about the, um, you know, the animal testing and biomed and all these other facilities that had a lot of similar outrage and were pulled. Um, that that's a factor in my mind. What I see my two options being is one, you know, there's there could be a motion to move the five million dollars away from Sunken Garden um, to something else we do as a city still need to maintain the facility so regardless there has to be a plan for how we renovate and i think a renovation has got to happen um, so no matter what that has to be a part of any path forward number two would be voting yes to the bond as is and whatever changes happen with the five million dollars allocated for sunken garden but there being a commitment to want a reduction in capacity because it's that seems like one of the non-negotiables right now is that the capacity is way too much right now um as well as continued um community engagement as it relates to the design which has been something that uh, is a possibility right now it's been stated a number of times that community can be involved and i want to see several meetings i don't want to see just one and i don't want to see it happen every time there's a vote and i i'll take some i'll take a bit of responsibility is that i feel as though um, it's easy to be frustrated if, say, I'm a city staff or I'm a city official or a council person, and um, I'm frustrated that it's two weeks into, two weeks away from a vote, and we have to now have a meeting and people feel upset. Um, and it feels last minute, but it's not the community's fault. I, there's a number of people here who have been at the bond meetings. Um, and if people don't feel as though they were made aware of this project and if they don't feel like they were aware of the design, that's not on the community, that is on city, that is on the city council, that's on all of us. And so um, just know that whatever path forward ends up happening, you have my commitment to work with all of you. Um, because I know even though maybe all of you don't get to vote for me, 
because I represent District 2. For those of you who uh, are in District 1 or in other districts, I still represent you. My vote still impacts you. And so I, I don't take that lightly. Um, so I really appreciate all of you for being here. I know this isn't easy to spend two hours of your time in a sometimes contentious setting. And so I really appreciate you guys who have uh, put yourself out there for this and just know that I'm hearing, I'm listening, and me and my team are going to be uh, working with Councilman Bravo and other council members to find a solution to this because there has to be one. Thank you. Councilman Bravo, did you have anything you wanted to say? Sure. I, I say, share uh, a lot of uh, the sentiments that Councilman McKee Rodriguez just uh, shared with you all. Um, I'm really grateful for everybody participating. This is a great turnout, uh, and I think that speaks a lot. Uh, and I, I'm glad. I, th I thought I saw Assistant City Manager Rod Sanchez on here earlier, so I'm glad he was able to hear some of this. Um, so that you know, that can easily get elevated to the City Manager's office. Um, and you know, I, I still have a lot of questions um, before I'm ready to support a project like this. Um, and I'm grateful to, to you all for bringing these these concerns to me, right? The, the concerns about traffic, the concerns about congestion, uh, about parking. Um, and so I, you know, I'm not sure what the path forward is yet. Um, I'm going to sit down and and review all this. We'll continue to take your input. Um, you know, I'm I'm personally wondering is there a possibility of uh, you know this is through po the Parks Bond Committee. And is there an opportunity to maybe um, make this just a general $5 million um, use for, because I think there's a lot of agreement that that there does need to be work and renovation there. It's just, we need more public input to decide what is the appropriate size for this project and, um, and get other input on it. And so is it possible to maybe move forward with a, some broad language on a five million dollars in park improvements, which could go towards Sunken Garden Theater renovation. Or if we can't get to consensus on that, then it could be other improvements in the park, uh, which wouldn't be a bad thing to, to invest in that park. Um, so I'm going to, I'm still going to, you know, stay open to exploring different options, um, and you know, we'll, we're going to continue this conversation um, beyond just this bond. So. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Thank you so much, everyone, and coming to attend this meeting. We have recorded it, and all of the comments will be captured in that recording. Um, our office will work with the District 2 office to go through them all and make sure that all questions and concerns get answered to the best of our abilities um, if they weren't answered tonight aloud. Um, we really appreciate your patience as we try to moderate this. We had at least 182 participants at one point. There, there may have been more, but that's the highest I saw it go. Um, we're really, really grateful for this input, and um, we're happy to hear all of the feedback that you've been providing to our offices. Um, Councilman, do either of you have anything else you'd like to say to wrap it up? Great job, Anissa. You did amazing as a moderator, and thank you to everybody who came out. I really appreciate it, and um, we'll be looking to get your get responses to you on all the questions in the chat um, that maybe didn't get addressed. Thanks, Great everybody. job, Anissa.